can you tell me a little bit about your role um, and and your background and kind of what you're working on at the moment? Sure. So um, I'm now a part-time full professor at the University of Cumbria in the UK, and I'm within the, the, the business subject area there, and I've been a professor of sustainability leadership there since 2012. Uh, but I'm part time because I spend a lot of my time helping uh, develop what's called the Deep Adaptation Forum, which launched a year ago to help bring people together to promote more kind and wise responses to societal breakdown induced by climate change. OK, and have you always been interested in this topic? Uh, I've always been interested since the age of 16 in environmental issues. Uh, environmental sustainability and yes it's been working on sustainability has been my career um, in working at the UN in environmental groups uh, as a business consultant and then in politics and then finally now um, uh, in academia and then this new approach which is uh, kind of like post sustainability really. What do you mean by that? Well, since 1992, when the world's government signed up to the idea of sustainable development, um, there was this hope that you could integrate economic, social and environmental considerations or balance them out and achieve progress within existing systems. And that was my paradigm until about 18 months ago. I mean, it, it didn't really feel right for the last five years because progress was so minimal. In fact, there was no progress in terms of impact on the environment. We were going backwards. Uh, things were getting worse. But, but um, yeah, it was about eighteen months or so ago, July twenty eighteen, when I decided to go public on my belief that we were sort of deluded uh, to keep keep on with this idea that we can sustain this system um, and society as we know it. And what is your belief now? Um, we face. Um, inevitable societal breakdown in most parts of the world because of direct or indirect impacts of climate change. Uh, I don't know where and when. Um, in, and, and, and we're learning more and more information every day uh, because um, observations of what's changing in our environment uh, are going much faster than the science to analyse them and explain them. I think one of the examples of that is the impact of coronavirus, uh, which there's quite a lot of evidence to show is itself related. Uh, the likelihood of it is related to climate change and habitat loss and biodiversity loss. And what do you then think of a lot of experts, you know, including Extinction Rebellion, including members of the UN and coming forward and trying to distance themselves from that narrative, from the fear of being linked to ecofascism? What is your response to that? So I, I do not know many people clearly making the link between climate change and uh, the likelihood of coronavirus outbreaks. Uh, there is science, for example, nine biologists in a paper just released undergoing peer review at the moment have shown how climate change is increasing the likelihood of coronavirus outbreaks. Um, they are mainstream biologists. Uh, and so I, I don't actually know many people coming out and saying there isn't a connection. I mean, we've got the UN and Lancet and quite established authorities saying that habitat loss and biodiversity loss is leading to more, um, more disease uh, for humans in the world because of coming from wildlife. And that's not uncontroversial at all. That's established science. But the direct connection with climate uh, is not being widely made yet, but it's you can go and find it. It's there. And so what do you make of then, you know, I think it was Dr. Mann from Columbia University who was quite knee jerk reaction to, to your response. Why do you think it is so contentious? Um, so Professor Michael Mann, uh, I think from Penn, Penn State University, he's he's um, he's a climatologist um, and it's uh, the connection between um, wildlife disease and outbreaks of human disease um, is in the realm of biology, epidemiology, 
and such like. And so both Michael Mann and myself, when we're looking at this topic, are doing so purely as generalists who are curious. So um, all I can do is cite sources, uh, which is what I do. And I join the dots of different studies of different biologists and epidemiologists to show that climate change is making it more likely that bats are ill, creating novel coronaviruses and coming in contact with humans more than before and shedding more of those viruses than before. And so if, if another person who is also not an epidemiologist or a biologist uh, wants to question that, then I would just invite them to cite their sources or refute the sources that I'm citing. So with the with the postponement of COP26 in Glasgow and a number of other kind of uh, climate discussions kind of being put on hold while governments currently deal with the short termism of, of, of an immediate plan for, for COVID-19 response, do you, what impact do you think COVID-19 will have on the climate change movement from a governmental perspective? I think um, the research showing the uh, link between climate change and the likelihood of outbreaks of disease, including coronavirus disease, the research on that is so new uh, and it's not really being paid much attention to. There's not been much funding gone into that area. And I think because of that, the connection has not been made. It's not world news yet. And so the full implications of making that connection um, are yet to be seen. So environmentalists, for example, if they make that connection, could say that it is a fundamentally unsafe response to bail out uh, companies that are high emitters or to uh, encourage stimulus uh, in the economy if it's a carbon intensive economy. Our lifestyles are that. It's actually unsafe. It's counterproductive. You're going to make future pandemics more likely uh, by increasing climate change. So that connection still needs to be made clearly. Of course, people can argue about the evidence for it and, and where, where we need more research, but I would invite them not to reject this out of hand. Um, it's not an opportunistic response. It's a fact based response. And those people who dismiss it need to actually have facts to dismiss it with. Otherwise, it's grossly irresponsible. So my first response to you is then the connections need to be made and then we can have the conversation about what, gov what effective government response should be. Um, but I think you were asking a little bit of in, more about how the government response to COVID may or may not influence the government response to climate. Is that right? Well, I mean, if you look at what Trump's doing with this rollback of, of environmental friendly policies to support the oil industry, uh, and then you have on top of that the, the postponement of COP26, right. uh, is this having more of a, of a devastating impact on the climate change movement by halting things? Or is this an opportunity, as you've mentioned, to, for them to actually piece things together and, and if, in essence, not return to, to steal from Naomi Klein, not return to the, you know, business as usual, because the business as usual was Australia burning and Amazon burning and uh, bleaching of the coral reef. So how do we actually, wh which way will it tip? Or are we at a tipping point? What What is that? It's a hard question, I appreciate, but just trying to no, understand. I understand, I understand. So I think the first thing to do is to 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 recognize that people like the UN Secretary General have said that uh, climate disruption is happening now and happening everywhere, obviously to varying degrees. And that means that adaptation to the disruption to our lives from climate change has to be a significant priority. It has to be up there with carbon cuts and drawdown. Lots of environmentalists in the past have not liked that idea because it sounded like giving in. But what we see now is that unless we really think about how do we adapt, how do we pull together once we realize that business as usual, civilization as usual, is under threat. Once we pull together around that, then we can actually find new ways of responding. And if we don't, then working on collective public issues can go out the window. Um, people can move into blame and uh, you know whatever is easiest to sort of absolve a leader of their own responsibility, which is what we're seeing at the moment. So I don't think we're seeing anywhere near enough multilateral cooperation on this pandemic. 
It's a reflection of the fact that multilateralism in general in the world is in decline, uh, on, including on, on climate. Maybe people through this will begin to realize you have to work together on the pandemic. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't work to, 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 to flatten the curve in one country if it's going to be uh, around the world and able to pop up again and spread around the world again. So hopefully people will realize that we live in one environment together and we share a destiny in terms of how we look after each other and the planet. Um, I hope. However, we're seeing a lot of um, more um, panic and fear driven responses. And um, so we, we're going to have to we're going to have to struggle for advocate for articulate for that more caring, smart, collaborative global response. That's for sure. Um, I I think for the climate movement. I think there's there's actually a there's a big lesson in COVID around the importance of personal vulnerability. So the climate movement generally has talked about what might happen in 2100 or 2050. So it didn't really matter for people who are super busy trying to put food on their table for their kids tomorrow. Uh, and actually climate change, as I mentioned, has become a, a disruptive force in everyone's lives everywhere, just to varying degrees already. And so we are now personally, all of us, vulnerable to climate change already. And we can see what happens, what, 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 what's invited from the state when we feel personally vulnerable, which is incredible changes to our personal freedoms in the name of actually trying to care for each other. And so that really goes against what the environmental movement, many of the professional environmental people have been saying for decades, which is don't worry anyone. Don't scare anyone. Um, let's sound reasonable. Let's sound reformist. Let's sound friendly to business. I mean, who's who's saying that now about COVID? Let's sound friendly to business. It just when it's a matter of life and death, that seems uh, it just seems inhuman. And yet we seem to tolerate that discourse for the environment when actually people, hundreds of millions of people are dying already because of climate change. And we all of us are becoming vulnerable now because of climate change. And that's not even without seeing COVID as partly a climate induced uh, event, which many people are now beginning to see it as. Great. Do you, do you think in terms of, I've heard a lot of resurgence of the Gaia hypothesis, which has been around for ages, but the earth is a self-regulating system and this has all been kind of the earth responding to that. Um, I think it goes a slightly a step further than your, your strictly factual based evidence of um, and your sources that you cite saying that this is, you know, climate change is causing this. Do you think that is a dangerous narrative? Um, and if so, why? Or is that a narrative that can be leveraged to help get more consumers on board and to, to seeing the connection between the two? So any perspective, any theory uh, can be shared from a fear based or a friendly or even love based uh, intention. And so the Gaia theory can be an invitation for people to realize that we live on this planet and what we do to wildlife what we do to ecosystems, what we do to our climate, ultimately rebounds on us. So we do it to ourselves. And so that can be shared as a philosophy to invite more attention to uh, collective well-being of humans, of, of animals, of whole the whole of life. But it can also be used as a sort of a, a way of avoiding pain, a way of avoiding uh, full attention to what's going on. Um, so if people say, oh, this is just the earth rebounding and Gaia having its revenge, um, then for me, I'm, that, that sounds like it's coming from a place of, of people just not being able to be with the pain and the suffering in the world right now. And I would just invite them to um, see where they can engage in this from a kinder place um, because um, Otherwise, it's just an excuse for trying to like distance yourself from the pain of what's happening in the world. Do you think it lends itself too easily to a slippery slope of ecofascism? Um, for me, um, there is the rise of proto-fascism and the 
um, the antecedents of fascism happening right now. We don't have to have theories about it. We don't have to have sort of ideas that um, there's a slippery slope. We've already got it. I mean, the the the, the powers that have been given to say Viktor Orban in in, in Hungary, um, you sh these powers should not be given. The EU. I thought was more than an economic block, and it's ridiculous that you can have a country giving such dictatorial powers um, to the leader within the European Union. It's, it's a disgrace. So I think what we need to do now is fight fascism as it's emerging everywhere right now with people with power. At the moment, environmentalists um, don't have any power, really. Um, so uh, I argue against anyone anywhere uh, calling for sort of inhuman, unaccountable use of force or disregarding human life, whether they say that they're an environmentalist or not. But I think we've got far greater threats to our own freedoms and our own well-being, uh, our own rights from leaders in power right now. Okay. Um and then I guess my, my other question is, what would your message be to consumers? What would your message be to the, the, the individuals who do see the connection? Uh, um, what I've realized as a consumer uh, who goes shopping and goes to restaurants and such like, is that um, I had got into a way of thinking where I thought my, um, my needs, my wants, my desires were unproblematic. It was just the way of living. You know, you just live and you spend some money and you consume stuff and services. So what's happened for me suddenly uh, living here uh, in Indonesia and uh, suddenly realizing that uh, a whole bunch of things that I depend on through the market economy may not be there. And also real realizing, well, uh, not being able to go out as well, um, like in Britain, suddenly um, I'm... I'm realizing that um, my needs and wants and desires are not um, are not what makes me, uh, and it's actually really been good to be invited out of habitual consumption. Um, I have been learning to cook again. Uh, I have been paying way more attention to my immediate environment, the garden, for example. Um, uh, it's 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 amazing how I've I've just started to look at books on my shelf again. Uh, I've uh, it's just I think somehow loosening the habit of consumption. That's what's happening in my life anyway. So I'm hearing that from other people, and I hope we don't I hope we don't lose that. It's, I hope we don't suddenly when lockdowns are lifted just think oh I want to just go to my favorite restaurant and start binge consuming. Um, I, I hope we think, oh, actually, uh, I didn't need that. I didn't need that. Um, I realize I just want more time. I want more time with my friends, want more time with my family, want more time at home, more time with books, more time with my guitar, less, less shopping and less running around. So I hope that that's what happens for more people. It's happening for me anyway. COVID-19 has obviously a generational component. It affects older people more so than it does younger people. Uh, the climate change is, is largely, I think, associated particularly now with the likes of Greta Thunberg with the younger people. Is there a tension, an intergenerational tension uh, with the COVID-19 and climate change um, context? Equally, having attended a conference real, um, on the sustainability transition into post-COVID-19 and seeing all men on the environmental front, uh, yet seeing recent Ipsos data that we've just produced that says women actually are more likely to care for uh, partners and neighbors and others in the COVID-19 crisis, is there also a gender component uh, to this? And Is there tensions between the two? Um, and how do you see that? Um. I know that sometimes uh, people talk about the older generations letting down the younger generations on climate change. Uh, and I think that's an unhelpful framing because it's misleading younger generations. We have seen centuries of people struggling to protect their environment. And there have been, uh, so there are people 
you know, in their 80s who've been lifelong environmental campaigners. And so if we set this up as an intergenerational schism or struggle, what we're doing is inviting people not to look at more important schisms and why environmentalism has failed for decades. And it was because we didn't look at power. We didn't look at capitalism. We thought that we could just persuade people in power, whether it's in corporations or governments, uh, to incorporate concern for environmental issues without changing anything systemically. And so our biggest mistake was not to see it as environmentalism as a political project. So framing things as somehow a, let, a generation letting down a younger generation mean it invites you away from learning from um, the history of struggle and where we've gone wrong. Um, and so I think it's a dangerous uh, uh, alley to go down. Um, and however, I do understand that young people can feel resentments um, because they're facing a future which uh, older people haven't had to face. Uh, and those resentments can be compounded when older people are confident in telling younger people about how the world really is and how they should just get on with their exams and just get a good job. Um, I think there's a very healthy whole scale rejection of the dominant values of mainstream culture uh, and all the kind of crap that young people will be hearing from their parents and grandparents about how life really is. So I understand the resentments and I and I welcome their rejection of dominant um, mainstream culture. However, setting it up as an intergenerational issue misses out on all the learning we can have from, as I said, over a century of struggle for pe of people trying to protect their environments against power, abuse of power, against the rampage of capitalism. You mentioned gender. Um, um, so many of the problems humanity faces, so many, whether it's um, gross inequality, um, whether it's a pandemic uh, and how that's made worse through inequality, whether it's environmental degradation and climate change. So many of these problems are the result of an economic and political system which uh, has um, been designed by and championed by and has served m men more than women and uh, attributes that we call masculine rather than those we might call feminine. Uh, and we need to look at that. Um, we need to see how um, patriarchy in some form may be at fault in all manner of problems in society, including even mental health. Um, so when I say patriarchy, I don't mean blame men. Um, patriarchy is created and supported uh, by all humans to certain degrees in different ways. So it's, but it's a looking at how we've privileged um, maleness, masculinities, certain types, um, and men over women, uh, and uh, and w how that may have injured our culture, our thinking, our ability to make sensible decisions, you know, as in not end up leading us into terrible, destructive behaviors as a species. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I think we've covered lots of the different topics that that we're planning to uh, to distill into a narrative into the film. Are you? Is there anything else that you we didn't cover that you would want to say? Or yeah, you asked me um, on email or on Twitter about why aren't more scientists and environmental activists talking about the. Uh, evidence for a connection between climate change and the likelihood of outbreaks of disease, including coronavirus. So I thought about that and I thought, well, you know, I, I don't know because I haven't talked to those people who are resistant to making those connections. But I do know that in my case, there was definitely a fear of being professionally criticized and being publicly ridiculed uh, for um, joining the dots of different scientific studies to um, offer uh, uh, an explanation um, which is at the moment not a mainstream one. 
And I think it's the kind of fear is is increased when you know that emotions are really running high, <laughs> uh, as they are right now with this pandemic. So I think there's there is that, but there's also a psychological barrier for for scholars, experts. We work damn hard over many many years to work at being able to have something to say on a very narrow area, and so so we're we're sort of uh, our whole world has been boxing reality into different domains, biology, economics, climate, whatever. And we've worked so hard in those boxes. So then to actually come out and actually sort of peer out to sort of like almost like a wider warehouse of knowing and say something relevant to that is can feel a bit like um, we're a bit uncertain about it. Uh, and it almost can feel a bit like an insult to all the work we've done over the decades to get some kind of uh, sense of confidence to speak just about this little one thing. Um, so I think we, we have that problem as experts. And then there's, there's people who've done research to say that people who are the most successful uh, academically are, are the most conservative. And I don't mean conservative in terms of um, voting. I just mean in terms of kind of accepting the system as it is and uh, being a bit allergic to radical thoughts. There's research on that. And I guess it's because we've spent so much time working our way up within dominant um, hierarchies and how how you know how society values um, people. So I think all those things are happening and holding back scientists and scholars from actually engaging with a fast changing environment which is posing massive challenges to normal life. 